pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on the agenda, we have the Board of Education norms. I haven't read through these in a while, so bear with me. I'm going to read through them tonight. Um, these are the Board of Education norms. Decision making focus on the best interests of students while ensuring that decisions are fiscally responsible, take into account current data, consider the impact on staff, and align with our mission of working together to create success at St. John R2 and beyond. Preparation and effective use of time. Come prepared for Board of Education meetings by reading the board packets prior to Board of Education meetings and proactively asking questions to allow time for answers to be collected and researched and then shared at the meeting. Speak with one voice. After deliberation and consensus on a subject, move forward together as a collective board while supporting the decision in words and actions privately and publicly. Do not speak on behalf of the board without authorization from the board. Act as ambassadors for the St. Genevieve Art II School District by consistently advocating for public education and staying up to date on happenings and initiatives within and around the school district. And listen to understand and communicate to explain. Respect and value the diverse perspectives, opinions, and contributions of all district stakeholders, including fellow board members, students and their families, employees, patrons, and community members. Be open-minded and engage in active listening while being aware of nonverbal behaviors as well. Encourage open and honest communication on a consistent and continuous basis. Nurture a spirit of harmony, cooperation, respect, and connectedness. Next, we have approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda of the February 21st, 2023 regular open session meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have the MSBA monthly report. Welcome to the February edition of the Missouri School Boards Association's board report. We begin with a look at the governor's state of the state address last month. On January 18th, Governor Parson delivered his annual state of the state address, which laid out his legislative agenda. Education was once again a focus. Now, as a product of public education, the father of a school teacher the grandfather of a first-year school teacher and preschooler, I know the American dream could not be possible for so many without a quality education. This year, we will again fully fund the foundation formula with an additional $117 million to ensure Missouri schools are receiving the support they need. During his speech, Governor Parson detailed the progress his administration has made in education funding, teacher pay, and workforce development. The governor's budget proposal also includes $233 million for school transportation needs, $32 million to expand the career ladder program, and continues the teacher baseline salary program that raised teacher pay from $25,000 to $38,000 per year. Additionally, the governor proposed $50 million for school safety grants for Missouri schools to make physical security investments on their campuses, develop security plans, establish school resource officer programs, and increase active threat trainings. Governor Parson also requested $56 million to expand pre-kindergarten options. There is a clear need to do better when it comes to early childhood. Let's meet this moment for Missouri families, Missouri kids, and our businesses. There are many issues being considered in the current session of the General Assembly that are of interest to MSBA and school board members throughout the state. As the legislative session progresses, we will keep you updated on these developments again this year through our legislative voice newsletters sent to members via email each Friday during the session, through critical issue alerts, periodic webinars, and MSBA's Action Center website. We urge you to stay in contact with your legislators during the session and communicate to them the impact legislation will have on your school district. MSBA Director of Governmental Relations, Brant Shields, says that in addition to advocating for your district, it's also important to serve as an educator to legislators. 
there's not really a space for subject matter experts in our legislature. They have to be uh, a foot deep and a mile wide across a whole bunch of, bunch of issues. So be that subject matter expert for them when it comes to public education and be that trusted source. So when they have questions, they know they can come to you as a locally elected school board member. On that note, don't miss your chance to visit your legislator at the Capitol during MSBA's Advocacy Day. Known formerly as Legislative Forum, Advocacy Day is scheduled for March 28th in Jefferson City. The event will be preceded by a spring virtual meeting on March 1st and weekly lunch and learn sessions on Fridays to provide legislative updates on the issues that matter to you. Check the MSBA website for registration information for all of these events. MSBA is also pleased to sponsor School Board Recognition Month in March, as proclaimed by Governor Parson. It's a great opportunity for school districts and communities to recognize the great work of school board members and the important role local boards of education play as leaders of our public schools. And finally, on January 31st, parents, school board members, school leaders, and supporters from St. Louis Public Schools, Normandy Schools Collaborative, and Kansas City Public Schools visited the Capitol for the Parent Day of Action. The group was recognized by both the House and Senate and then set out to visit with legislators before ending the day with a rally for supporters in the Capitol Rotunda. Matt Davis, president of the City of St. Louis Board of Education, explained why it's important to tell the stories of local schools. It's important to have the parents come, meet their legislators, meet legislators that they don't necessarily know but are passing bills that affect our schools and our students and tell their stories and to just sort of explain from their perspective why they are so happy with their public schools and why it's important to strengthen them. Kansas City School Board member Jennifer Wolfsey says that although the Parents' Day of Action involved St. Louis and Kansas City parents, advocating for public schools is for everyone, regardless of district size. I mean, really, there's more similarities between um, Kansas City and St. Louis and rural schools than there are um, differences a lot of times. That's it for this month's edition of the MSBA Board Report. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting and for all that you do to ensure all students succeed. Next on the agenda, we have the consent agenda. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have guidelines for public participation. Board members and administrators will listen to concerns and respond when appropriate by mail or telephone at a later date. The public comment period will not exceed 15 minutes. No individual will be permitted to speak more than once during this period, and each speaker will be allowed of no more than five minutes. For policy DDDH-1, public participation at board meetings. The following guidelines and procedures will be followed. In order to speak to the public participation, a public comment form must be filled out and submitted to the board president prior to the beginning of the meeting. The public comment period will not exceed 15 minutes. No individual will be permitted to speak more than once, and each speaker will be allowed in no more than five minutes. I have no public comment cards. I do not either. Thank you. Next, we have a report of the superintendent. Thank you. Um, the first item on my report, there is a note of appreciation in the board docs from Mr. Draper, thanking you for the tuition reimbursement program and basically supporting his professional growth. It's a very nice thank you letter. Um, next, K through 12 enrollment. Uh, our official count date is the last Wednesday in January, or since we were out of school the next day. Um, so our K through 12 enrollment, if you look at the bottom of the data, January enrollment uh, this year was 1,764. That is down a few students from the previous year. Um, so I feel like, you know, we're staying right in there. So we're very happy with that number. Of course, we would like to like it to be much higher, but you know, it's a good number for us. The pre-K enrollment, um, as you see with the other years of data here, from the first day, which is an estimate to our January count, grows. Um, but again, that's because we're, our parents as teachers are out there working, finding children who qualify, especially for our early childhood special education program. So there's growth in our preschool numbers. Any questions on enrollment? The next item is just an informational slide. 
as they said in the MSBA board report, next month is board member recognition month. <clears throat> Sorry, I forgot to take the word week out of there. Um, so we thought we would just throw it out there and let the public know that next month is board member recognition. And so we've not seen those pictures yet, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a little surprise there. So. <laughs> um, next is just a reminder about uh, kindergarten registrations. Uh, accepting appointments began today, so I imagine the phones at the elementary were on fire this morning. <clears throat> with all the calls coming in. Uh, St. John Elementary has their registration on Saturday, or their screening on Saturday, March 25th, 8 to 2. Bloomsdale's is April 1st from 8 to 1. Has, was it a busy day, ladies? No, it was busy. Excuse me, extremely busy. We were at 50 calls today. 50? Okay. Well, if you have a preschooler or a kindergarten, a student coming to kindergarten and you would like them screened, we would really appreciate it if you would call, get them signed up for this event, and we'll go through the screenings and help you out. I noticed like this year's graduating class, <clears throat> what, like 110? Yeah. And then I look at kindergarten and first grade, you're looking at 156 and 149, mm -hmm. so they're certainly growing. Yes. Um, my next item are the principal reports. So, looks like Bloomsdale Elementary is going to go first. Okay, and I like to start with the positive office referrals. We're going to start with the good news. Uh, many students were portraying the seven habits that we practice out at Bloomsdale. We have, starting at the top, Louis Guilford, Carly Beat, Liam Edwards, Oakland Paisley, and Colton Bates. Then the next row, Lincoln Nugent, Levi Karen, Gabriella Keith, Lily Schwint, Jack Ballou, Caden Marler, Cash Stolzer. And then the bottom row, Daniel Klump, Levi Karen again, Jaden Hogan, Jay Swinkler, Kendall Wagner, Sophia Certain, and Rogan Zuspin. They were all excited to receive their award and they are keeping those in their leader binders. That's where they keep their certificates to show their parents. So. And on January 11th, we had our second quarter awards assembly. Um, the students received awards and got to walk the red carpet. As you can see, Miss Rice and Miss Guilford did partake as well. Evidently, the students know us dance the gritty, <laughs> they all did the gritty walking down the red carpet. Um, they had different awards, the Certified Smile Maker, um, Awesome Author, Working Wonder, and Bride and Dragon. So they were excited to receive their award and be recognized for that. On January 3rd, we celebrated the 100th day of school. Uh, mostly it was our first thing, kindergarten and first grade teachers that participated in this with their students too. Uh, recognize the exciting things the students have learned after 100 days of school. And so the day was all centered around the number 100. Tied in a lot of math on that day. And then on February 9th, our third grade students participated in a bell concert um, with Mr. Friedmeier. And I will say this was one of the neatest little concerts I had seen in a while because you, we're used to singing and performing and dancing. And this was all um, using bells. Uh, he said the students began preparing for the concert by carefully, carefully analyzing their bell part that was shown on, it was projected on the big screen. Um, they were shown how to properly hold the bell and how to play it when their colored dot appeared on the screen. Students were also shown proper concert etiquette, how to enter, leave, not talk, bow, and musicianship. So it was an exciting evening for the students. They did a wonderful job. And that was it for me, but looking ahead, next week we have Read On Missouri Week, and we have several exciting things planned, and I know many of you had signed up to come read to our students. I encourage you to come out. We love having you in the building, so I appreciate you signing up, and if you haven't yet, Ms. Foth has that. Um, I think, I believe she shared it out with all of you. And then, of course, the construction is the big excitement at Bloomsdale, <laughs> but I believe Bailey will have that, maybe some of that later, so... 
um, we're all very excited. The students noticed today that the ceiling tiles were out, and um, so that was a, a big deal to them. So exciting times at Bloomsdale. Thank you. Thank you. Evening. I don't know which TV to look at. I think I'll look at this one. <laughs> it's a little close right there. So at St. Genevieve Elementary, we kicked off the second semester with, we did a one school, one book initiative, and we did dragons in a bag. And we used our funds to buy every student in the school a book. And we did a kickoff assembly, and then we took sort of um, Guest readers did a chapter and we did videos and we put those out to the students and the teachers shared those and we did have some chapters where the teachers read the um, chapters to the students and we did the finale with the three doctors right there finishing up um, as our guest readers and so that was nice to get um, books into the hands of all of our students so that was a great way to kick off second semester. And then we also had our second quarter power leaders, and they're featured there in the middle, and they were um, selected, and then the second quarter trolley was there. But then we also had the first semester power leader ceremony, and then we had Bailey Ram and Emily Clayton. They emceed the celebration, and there were a couple of pictures from the ceremony. Um, the committee kind of put together a new set of decorations and it was all superhero themed and it was really cute but you didn't get to see the whole um, stage because I don't know whoever took the pictures they didn't capture the whole stage but it was really super cute the whole stage was a superhero theme so that was a great way to start second semester and then we had a lot of things going on here so We'll start on the left and then we'll get to the fun stuff on the right. So we had, in January, we celebrated our December Students of the Month. We had K2 and 3-5 luncheons. And then at the bottom, we had the January Students of the Month. We celebrated them in February. And Mr. Kingery is way better at taking those selfies than I am. Like, he was out that day and I tried really, really hard, but he is so much better at that than I am. <laughs> And then we had our second quarter Dragon Track Rewards, and in the middle, when some of the classes spun, they landed on PE with the principals, and so Mr. Kingery and I had like seven classes earned PE with the principals, and we're like, oh my gosh, we cannot do this seven times. <laughs> so we're like, what are we going to do? So we combined classes, and we had little kickball tournaments. And so we have three different times where we played kickball with the classes, and so that was a lot of fun. And so those are pictures there in the middle. And then on the right, this was like the culminating activity, we had like six classes landed on duct tape Mr. Kingery. And I think only one of our classes was a fifth grade class. The rest of them were like kindergarten and first grade classes, and then we had one resource class. So you can only imagine that the duct tape wasn't really tight on there. And so I have a beginning, middle, and end. And so you can see in the middle, he's like, oh my gosh, this is not working. <laughs> and so I had to zoom in on his face because he kept looking at me and he kept saying, I am going to face plant. And I'm like, oh, you're going to be fine. And then <laughs> you're going to be fine. And then I kind of cropped it out, but the bottom picture you can see like coach started to pull the mats away and he already was like you could hear the tape ripping away from the wall and he started to slide and somehow like Mr. Mueller must have been watching like our Zoom and oh oh he called in to tell us that our duct tape wasn't strong enough <laughs> we didn't pick the right kind and but it was all in fun and the kids loved it but when you know better, you do better. So we'll buy Gorilla Tape next time. Yeah, so, but it was all in fun. So that was, was a lot of fun. So worth it. And then this slide is a whole bunch of everything. So in February, we celebrated our counselors, Mrs. Kingery and Mrs. Griminger. And so we have some students pictured there with them. And then Mrs. Beckett, who does our social media, she had a little thank you post that she put out on social media. And then down at the bottom, we also celebrated School Resource Officer Day. 
and we had some gifts that the building got for her, and she, um, Officer Clark, wouldn't let us take a picture of her, so we had to go find one to put on her of her, so that's what she got. And then we also celebrated the 100th day, and we have um, Mrs. Brown's kindergarten class up there, and I just had to put one of the little pictures up there of one of our little kindergarten friends. They used like a photo aging app, and that was just so cute of her. She just, so cute. And then at the bottom, we had some Valentine activities in the fifth grade. Um, every year they do sign up sort of a competition, and those were just some of those there. And then second semester, the Dancing Dragons, they brought in some new kindergarten and first grade recruits. And then some of the students that wanted off, they were able to get off. So this is our new group of Dancing Dragons that will take us through the end of this school year, and they will start next school year. That's that slide. And then these are our positive office referrals. Um, some of these were from January that we didn't present in January, and so that's why we have a couple Christmas hats in there. Um, our top row, Elizabeth Kelly, Chase Dunsey, Jackson Wolf, Malaya Evans, Jason Miles, and Paxton Hook. In our middle row, Bentley Cornell, Macy Champion, Layla Reinhardt, Mason Hilbert, Jackson Wolf with his second referral that, um, that time, and Jameson Walk. And at the bottom, Vera Rutler and Hunter Klein. And then our last slide, our January and February future teacher and super staff were Cheryl, Cheryl Wolstetter and Miranda Hines and Rose Peitler and Peggy Donert. And I think I might have gotten that. Oh, that's right. And those ladies were just nominated for their hard work in the building and everything they do. So that's it for St. Elementary. So first up, we have our spelling bee winners. Um, on starting on the left, we have Joseph Rutler, Shaylin Shimento, Reese Webinmeyer, and Silas Sansusi. Um, and I think Shaylin got first. And then next is uh, second quarter wings is so wings is like if you have like no missing assignments, no D's or F's, um, you like get this reward. It's like a one hour recess. You get a free hour. You do games like Twister or Jenga or Connect Four, and then there's usually a snack, and yeah. <laughs> There's also volleyball, um, anything you want to play on the court, basketball, and basically it gives students an opportunity to get a free hour, so personally I think that it helps students push farther to reach uh, that goal to get there. Um, next up is the Clavius Project, it is at SLU, um, our robotics team. Uh, Mr. Roth is a teacher. They went up there on a weekend, and we got second um, in the gold one. Some of our students got 100 on their test, which is really good for them, I'm guessing. Um, East Central Honors Choir is on the next slide. Uh, up there, they went to East Central. They showed them their vocal skills, and yeah. And then Scholar Bowl season is underway. We have a great, unique uh, group of students who are striving to reach their goal. Um, we have some fundraisers continuing through the end of this month. Um, sixth grade is selling Little Caesars Pizza Kits, and then seventh grade is selling Otis Spunkmeyer, and eighth grade is selling chocolate bars. Dragon on Dragons on Fire is like just for kids who go above and beyond and doing the seven habits. But some that got it this semester are Ashton, Dom, Clayton, Webb, Sydney, Nieseling, Lucas Martin, Kinley, Ann Brawley, Addison Wilson, Jalen Pipkin, and Harley Courtway. Riley Pollock, Blair Bowman, Blake Grass, Courtney Gunther, Wyatt Schmelsley, Haley Schweiss, Dominic DiMicurio, and Mackenzie Knight. Josh Whitworth, Emily Sawtell, Anthony Apt, Owen Roth, 
Caden Mueller, Jacob, Jacob Gross, and Hunter Garrett, who got it twice. He's at the top. He's just a very great student who's always such a gentleman to all and just is just always good. Okay? So, yeah. <laughs> Um, next, we have our Spotlight Award. Um, this month, we have it every single month, and this month is Mr. Corey Samples and the quotes from all the different people that nominated him. Uh, the first one is, Corey is such a cool dude. He does what is asked of him and what is needed to make sure his kiddos are successful. I love listening and watching him with the kids and how they respond to him. Corey goes above and beyond for all our kids, even going to extreme levels of having dinner with them, one with one student each week. Corey has a heart of gold. He makes personal connections with kids and makes a huge difference for those kiddos. He is such a fun and like loving teacher. He cares for all students. He's always like, "What's up, K Dog?" in the hallway. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's ahead is NJ Test Lock in, which is um, February 24th, which is this Friday. Fifth grade visits the SGMS. This is March 7th. Fin uh, fifth grade parent night, MAJHAA Honors Band at Central. Um, on the 11th of March, there is a Jazz Fest at MAC. On the 22nd of March, the Big Smiles Dental Clinic is coming in. And on March 26th, there's the SMS Spring Play, and they would love to see everyone there. It's called Murder in the Air, by the way. <laughs> so, this month is going to be really, like, sports heavy, because it's, like, tournament season. Okay, so... Some of the stuff on the this title slide, up on the top middle, you can see Mr. App's class building the second bench in the senior tee. And then later we'll talk about the black wall behind it. And then on the very bottom middle, you can see some of the cadet teachers with their kindergarten students or their first grade students just kind of making t-shirts and stuff. Excellent. Um, these are our positive officer pearls, and we have our Elk Student of the Month, who is Brenna Wiener, and our Rotary Student of the Month, which was uh, Lainey Yamitz. Uh, and then our positive officer pearls was Jordan Grau, twice, Brendan Sexton, Sarah Bone, Gavin Hook, Chloe Wolk, Trey Bloom, Allison McCrory, Allison Bowen, or Alyssa Bowen, uh, Tasha DeClue, Carson Krylick, Hannah Bly, Zana Powell, Miranda Ponder, Mariah Apt, Savannah German, Haley Pierdeck, Lily Fanestock, Ethan Maloney, Ezra Wolk, Kylie Harris, Dalton Bowen, Chloe Gross, and Faith Portwood. Why is that always that video? This is like the third month in a row. It keeps showing up. Um, okay, so Aiden Boyer scored his 1,000 point, um, well, points at the Arcadia Valley game. Um... Oh, yeah. Caden signed with McKendree University. Um, do you know what day that was? That's all right. Uh, the boys' conference, they placed second, losing to Park Hill Central, and it was such a rough game, but they kept them under um, a continuous clock, so that's better than the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ricky broke the SGHS shooting record during that conference game. Um, and then I spoke with his mom, Laura, and he <coughs> is currently, so I think the record was 1,408, and currently he's at 1,454, and there's still more games to go. And also, it's not on there, but, um, <laughs> Hang on. but, okay. uh, our Scholar Bowl team, our, high, our varsity Scholar Bowl team is currently three and six. Uh, we have no seniors on the team. It's a handful of juniors and a few sophomores as well. And our JV team is undefeated uh, with mostly freshmen on their team as well. Um, on this slide, we have the girls' basketball team. They're playing for fifth or sixth in, in the conference tournament. And then wrestling, our state qualifiers, um, we had a send-off today for them. 
Uh, the girls play second in districts, uh, and then six of the girl wrestlers qualify for state. And then with uh, boys wrestling, they play second in the Class 2 District 1 tournament uh, with 12 of their wrestlers going to state. And before we move on, that girls basketball, they're going to districts March 1st. It's at 7, and it's here. So for anyone wanting to go to that. Oh, and, and girls senior night is tomorrow, and then the boys senior night is the next day on Thursday. Oh, and today, if, if nobody knew, we sent the wrestlers off today. Oh, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. We did. Oh, we did. Okay. So our FBLA students, um, five of them placed, like, at least five at districts, and I have their names written down. Emily Olibach, Katie Ani, Trey Bloom, and Jeremiah Coons placed first in their categories. Um, Hannah Ahrens and Drew Merriman placed second and third as a team. Colton Caps and Logan Moore placed fourth and first as a team. Carly Bosler placed fifth in her category. Heidi Schmelzley placed third and second alone, and Chloe Staffen placed second place. And then the two pictures on the right are our counselors and holding their little signs and celebrating their counselors' appreciation month. Week. Oh, okay. Um, also, so I think we had some like technical difficulties. Um, so rolly chair basketball was a super fun week. It really just gets the morale going, and it, every student enjoys it. Like it's something for everybody to have fun at and like look forward to at the end of the week. Um, those are some of the crazy pictures we had. I can clear. I don't have the thing, but. So if we have time, there's this two-minute video from the DLP crew, and they made what they call a hype video for early chair basketball, and it's just some of the teachers who are playing. So do we have time? Let's get this thing rolling. Everybody get up, it's time to slam now. We got a real jam going down. Welcome to the Space Jam. Space jam. Here's your chance, do your dance at the Space Jam. All right. All right. Well, we know we have the better swing on this team. Uh, this is our teacher of the month for February. It's Miss Newman. She's our uh, facts teacher. Um, and her 
a quote that a student uh, batters. Um, this teacher read what I was going. Oh, this teacher read what I was going through and started caring even more about me. She was next to me the whole time I was upset. She has just been really understanding and caring for each and every one of her students. She cares for everyone like they are her own child. While I'm in her class, I feel like I won't be judged by how safe of a classroom and how friendly her and other students are. Thank you for the service to our students at SGHS, Ms. Newman. And then, oh, if her we quote have says, it, yeah, go for it. Um, you believed in Santa for life, eight years. You can believe in yourself for five minutes. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. And I updated the slide. There are a couple of safety reports in the board in board docs. So it'll probably refresh in five minutes. So and that is the end of my report. Thank you. Next, we have unfinished business on the agenda, and the first item is the instructional program presentation for middle school English language arts. All right, but welcome. Um, my name is Crystal Kino. I teach seventh and eighth grade language arts at the middle school. Um, this is Carla Bosler. Hi, I teach um, eighth grade ELA and reading, and then I teach advanced eighth grade, and then I have seventh and eighth grade drama. And I'm Ashley Worsluck. I teach 6th grade reading and language arts. Kelly Jokers, also 6th grade language and reading arts. Michelle Cole, co English, our ELA in reading and in program reading. Um, Brian Mueller, program uh, ELA 6th, 7th, and 8th, and in co 7th, and co as well. These are kind of our department goals at the most language classes. We uh, want to foster our love and passion for reading. You're going to see a lot of our projects and a lot of our reading pictures. Um, that's something that we feel very passionate about. We want to build capable writers to thrive past St. Gen High School even to be you know, productive in the 21st century, and to develop and promote critical thinking skills. All right, so these are our classes. We kind of went over them um, as we introduced ourselves. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade ELA. Um, Carla and I have seventh and eighth grade advanced. We have sixth grade reading. Um, we do have a seventh and eighth grade reading class. It's kind of a remedial class um, to help our kids that are kind of falling behind. We also offer our co taught classes in sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, and have program reading for 6th, 7th, and 8th language and reading as well. Okay, so um, Ashley and I are going to do what we do best, and we're just going to bounce back and forth. Yeah. So I'll start with 6th uh, grade ELA. Uh, this is what we've accomplished so far this year. So our writing, we've done a descriptive writing, a narrative, a research, Persuasive. Persuasive is always middle schoolers' favorite because they get to argue. Um, <laughs> it's our job to teach them how to argue correctly, cite their evidence, use research, all that good stuff. Um, we also do a friendly letter, figurative language. They do weekly podcasts. So every week they're listening to a podcast to practice their listening skills. That's one that's always hit. So And they love them. They're actually really, I mean, yeah. they want to listen to them because they're actually really engaging too. So that's something really fun that do in there and then also obviously throughout the week with our bell work and everything else we're doing many different language writing other skills too, grammar skills throughout that's mixed in through all of that too um, some things we have not accomplished yet this year but will is a poetry unit where they will learn different types of poetry and have to write their own and also do a compare and contrast writing so for sixth grade reading um, so far we I mean throughout mostly in first quarter and even second quarter we really hit the short stories for nonfiction and fiction and that's what we hit hard first of all to develop their understanding of plot and going over story elements before we would dive into any novel which now officially in second semester we have started our first whole class novel which is refugee um which is a 
class favorite, fan favorite. They absolutely love Refugee. Um, we did link a video for you guys to watch later if you really want to, so you can watch, but it is, um, it's just a great story. It teaches them so many things about empathy, learning about different cultures, what other kids go through in different places, um, other things in history. It's a realistic fiction, um, but it just, it goes over so many amazing different things that we can touch on in one book for them, and they love it. And all three characters are their age. So some of this stuff is relatable and some of the stuff is not relatable to them because they are all three characters are refugees. So our, our students don't understand that, um, which is cool for them to process and figure out. Um, and I, I will say that one of, it is in Syria, which the earthquake just happened in Turkey and Syria. So even my students, and I know you had mentioned it too, had said something and it obviously, it was back with the Syrian war, but they were able to make that connection that that just happened in Syria and we're reading about it. So that was neat to be able to bring that into it too, as well. Yep. Um, so we also do a lot of nonfiction, obviously. One of the new things for us this year is a program called Reading Plus. This is a completely online program. Our students do about 15 minutes a day, um, but which sounds like a lot, it is a lot. It's hard for us to give up those 15 minutes, but we've seen a lot of growth in our students. Um, and the cool thing is they take like a diagnostic and then every week they're assigned lessons and either reading or vocabulary will change. One week they might have three. One week they might have seven lessons in reading. Um, but it's based on how they do that week. It does fluency. It does their reading level. Um, vocabulary. Yeah, of course, vocabulary yeah. comprehension. We can get on at any point. We can see where they at, where they're at. We get notifications when they level up, so then we can just hit send notification, they get an email in within the program, and they think that's cool. And they'll respond, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. No, no. Yeah. Um, the other thing we like about it, so they take a diagnostic at the beginning, there's a mid and then an end of the year. Um, the really cool thing is with that, we looked at our data again. From, in, from NWA. Yep. From NWA, we could see growth, and then we kind of matched it to this program, too. And they are correlating very well, which makes us happy because, you know, when you get a new program, you don't know. We actually got this program and fell into our laps. Um, when we went to River PD last year, there was Windsor that talked highly about this program. Our seven. And I think it was just those two schools. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we were like, well, what let's try it. We yeah. Need, we need something that gauges. Because when I first started here, we were using old school, like Gates, paper, pencil, test gave a great level. And I feel like we've gone through different things. And so this is probably the first thing I think that Ashley and I can really agree with. It's going to be a pretty accurate reading level and easily for Yes. Us. And also so. it bases it on other things too. And of course, they have to put a little bit of effort in too, you know, because it'll give them, if they, if they go through and they rush, it'll give them more oh, yeah. comprehension. And then they're like, oh, yeah, this isn't what I wanted the next week because it restarts every Monday. But we were able to see, um, we based it on from fall NWA to our winter NWA, and we were <coughs> pleased with. Um, and it's also not just for, like, struggling readers. Our kiddos that are reading on a, like, 7th and 8th grade level now, like, we're, we've kind of come back a little bit on it, and we're allowing them to read their library book more because they do really enjoy reading some of them. But they're like, this is getting hard. I'm like, well, yeah, you're a sixth grader. If you're reading on eighth grade level, it's going to get hard. Like, but it's awesome. It's enrichment for them, too. So. And then we will, um, this year still, after we finish Refugee, we are going to hit Folk Tales. And then also we have um, another, towards the end of the year, um, we read School. So, so that's what we have. And that's sixth grade. All right, so I usually do seventh grade with Audra Lomax. She's home cuddling a very sweet baby girl. Um, so I'm going to take over for seventh grade. So far this year, we always start off the year with short stories, going over a plot, going over story elements, all that kind of reviewing. Um, we've already hit A Long Walk to Water. This is a based off a true story um, of Salva Dukes. He's from um, Africa and how his family, um, he gets torn from his family. Um, due to a uh, civil war going on, and he's kind of forced to survive on his own in Africa, in the savannah, with no water, trying to figure out how to manage not getting caught up into the war and just surviving. Um, and it's fan I love it because it allows them, like I said, with refugee, it gives them the chance to see what life's like in another culture and to develop that empathy. So this book allows it. 
Um, and then we have the Outsiders. It's probably one of the fan favorite. I love the Outsiders. We're just finished it. We just finished it okay. today. Um, and so my heart's a little broken because it's kind of my favorite book. But the kids love it too. They can relate so much to the characters. Even though the story takes place in the 1960s, they can see themselves in at least one of the greasers. Um, and so <laughs> it allows. And so much fun to hear from them. They always have great conversations and they always like talk about who their favorite is. Um, we hit nonfiction throughout the year. We try to keep up with like news articles um, and just really trying to keep them talking about what's kind of going on in our life and related to them. And we talk about annotating and pulling and making conversations and those deep thoughts from there. One of the big focuses this year has been on independent reading. Um, they have been very, you're going to see some pictures of some of our very um, fluent regulars in the library and they are doing an amazing job. And what we love is that probably for some of our kids, they may be finishing like, gosh, I have kids that are probably like finishing 50 books already and it's only February. And maybe a year ago, they may only have finished maybe five or 10. So it's so exciting to see and we just think of all the skills and like the reading that they're doing is awesome. Um, we've already done a descriptive and a narrative writing. Um, they have a lot of fun with those because those are usually fictional and they can develop. Um, we're getting ready to start figurative language and poetry, which is, I love that. Uh, we have another novel I hope we're going to be able to get to it. Um, it's called Michael Bay, Prisoner of Cell 25. It's kind of like a sci-fi, so they are probably going to love that. Uh, it's about this kid who is very unique. He has like an electrical power. Um, that nobody really knows about, and he's kind of being hunted because of this power, and he finds that he's not alone, there are other kids like him, so it's kind of cool. And it's a series, so usually those, if they can read the first, will jump into the rest. And then finally, we always do a personal reflection at the end of the year to kind of allow them to take a moment, not just to look at, like, the year, but themselves, and by the end of seventh grade, they've really started to kind of mold into who they want to be, and they start thinking about it, so this becomes a really fun kind of project for them. Okay, um, we both teach 8th grade uh, ELA together, so we've done our short stories. Our whole class novel that we read so far this year is Scythe by Neil Schusterman. It's a science fiction. The kids love it because you have a male and a female protagonist, and the story you know, keeps flip-flopping between these two characters, and um, one of them will become a Scythe at the end of it, and so you always have who you're rooting for, and we do a lot of like compare and contrast, like who do you think should win, why. Um, so we do that writing piece in there with it. We do a lot with the novel because it is pretty, it's a long one. Uh, then uh, we try to weave nonfiction in throughout all year long, different nonfiction articles, different articles of the week. <coughs> Again, really heavy on independent reading. And we're going to kind of talk about for eighth grade, we set a kind of a uh, far out there goal, but we asked each kid to try to read a million words this year. And we actually have kids that have reached that and we'll show you a slide of the kids that have reached that but right now Mr. Mueller and I co-teach and one of our kiddos in fourth hour I think this will happen tomorrow based on all the data that has happened but yeah um, so we have them record their readings on these reading logs so mine are all sorry this is kind of like sloppy and they're falling but they are all logging what they read we calculate page numbers with them uh, while we grade like what they do with this kid's being ready to hit 2 million, I think, tomorrow. So I'm like a really super proud teacher. He um, has a, maybe a bet going on with Mr. Mueller that if he accomplishes his 2 million by the end of the week, you know. Um, and so it's been a big hype in our room. And so it's really exciting to see. Um, it's even exciting to see the kids who hadn't finished a book in over a year or two years or whatever. They might tell me that everybody's finished at least two to three this year. Um, so it, that's kind of like tugs on my heartstrings a lot. It's really my passion. To piggyback off what she said too, I've had um, a student, well we have a student that's a uh, struggling reader, but he has um, found a book, it's actually Michael Bay, and he's reading it and he's like, he looks at me he's like, I think this is the first book I've actually like paid attention to and I'm reading it. Uh, and so it's cool we love when we to see with them, them finding those books that they connect to and enjoy actually because before they're just reading dire movie kid right and we're trying to push them out of their comfort zone a little bit and move them to more complex stuff uh, we completed the narrative writing compare contrast uh, right now we just started our argumentative or persuasive essay um, and so 
what we will do is we always reunite every year uh, by Ellie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, and that one always is just such an eye opener to them. So we will get to that. I'm thinking end of this month, maybe early next, and then we have poetry and figurative language to hit. Okay, our advanced classes, uh, kind of the same thing. We try to go <laughs> deeper and extend further into what they're doing. So same thing with the independent reading. Um, instead of doing a whole group uh, novel this year, we did a lit circle. So they had three different book choices and were group put in groups. And then they had discussions on those just like, you know, I would in an adult book club. So we're trying to get them ready for, you know, everyday skills that I hope they use in their future. Um, we are trying to create a podcast with them still this year. Uh, probably one of my favorite projects this year was the Christmas parody that they wrote. So taking a Christmas song and writing a parody and then making them sing it and try to sing it along to the tune. That was fun for me. Uh, I think it was fun for them too. But uh, we're working on a debate right now. We are reading about uh, Lizzie Borden and they're going to be writing a um, persuasive piece. They are either going to draw out of the hat that they have to argue for the side of the prosecution or for the defense. Um, and so I'm excited to see what they'll do there. Uh, we will also read night with them. That wasn't something that we felt like we should part with them just because they're in our advanced class. They all need to know about the events that happened in the Holocaust. And then the seventh graders are going to read the diary of Anne Frank so that we can read night when they get to eighth grade. Oh, we have we can pass these around some of our projects from our advanced kids, and so you can kind of look at them and see the love they have for their reading. We're trying to see pictures, so you can kind of come around if you guys want to see them. Oh, this is from our advanced oh. kids. She was just talking about the Christmas parody. Um, the left one is the original, and then the right one is the parody. Um, I don't have the sound clip. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's weird. I'm sure you can comment right. to yourself. <laughs> So that's the beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And then I think the next slide has um, the propaganda poster that they created. So, so this was one of their end of the projects uh, that they did. Um, and this was over the book, The Testing. So if they did their post up, poster on the viewpoint of the rebel, then they had to write a speech um, on the government's viewpoint. And so they had to work on understanding different perspectives and how your persuasive language changes depending on who you are and who your audience is. Um, and actually, that's hers right there sitting there and <laughs> presented earlier. She did a fabulous job. <laughs> yep, point you out. <laughs> yep. All right, so usually Audra's, she teaches a seventh and eighth grade reading class. This is kind of our remedial class. Typically, we um, select students who are about two or more grade levels below um, for this class. And basically, we're trying to give them tools to help them get back caught up to where they need to be. Um, they, we, they also do reading plus. I honestly don't know a lot about that, unfortunately, because sixth grade does that, and then her class does it. Um, I do know that we were actually able to kind of push some kids out of this reading class because of the success and growth that they've shown in it. We think a part of that is because that's what we're hoping to see continual growth with these kids. Um, we focus on full class novels. They are usually going to be high interest books, um, a little bit on the lower level so that we can meet their needs, but they can still kind of discuss and have those ideas. We're trying to build their confidence in reading. We also, there'll be small groups, so we'll work on um, a lot of our kids we notice may have difficulties in different areas. So like, it might be fluency, comprehension, decoding, is it a phonics thing? So we try to group them and try to work with them a little bit more one-on-one -on -one to help build those skills and that confidence too so they become better at reading. Um, but this is kind of a fluent class and you can move, or kind of go in and out as the year goes because once we see they something clicks, that light bulb comes on, we notice that like they're soaring then. They don't need to be in there. And so they kind of earn their way out in the opposite. When we see that there's a need from someone in the class that maybe got missed, we can push them back into it and say, hey, we've, we've got some pieces that we need to kind of put together um, before you go on. Um, so then this focuses mostly with our seventh and eighth grade because sixth grade, they do have a reading class already built in their schedule, but our seventh and eighth graders, unfortunately, don't. We have to do it in our language class. Um, and sometimes it's just not enough time in our class. So this does help kind of pick up those kids. All right, so our um, program reading 
we try to stick with the curriculum as much as we can when making adaptations to fit the needs of our students. So our books are again like the seventh and eighth grade reading club. We try to find high interest books that are just at a little lower level, but we cover all the same skills that they cover in the um, regular ed classes. Um, we just kind of slow things down, lower level, and then if there needs to be repetition, we do that. Um, and to kind of add with what she said too, and to piggyback off what Ms. Keel said or Crystal said, uh, um, we do have a lot of students that we see increasing reading levels throughout. We do um, Haggerty, we started doing it, we do letters um, implementation in the classroom, but we've seen them grow where we're able to see them being pushed out into co-taught settings um, and seeing them successful in there. Um, we have a the grader that, I, that we've talked about and he has been doing fantastic. I think so far this year you were able to push two, two or three into our co-taught. Yeah, they've so. been doing very well um, and it's been a good fit and a good switch for that to push farther and I think they're getting even more independent reading done in that class as well. Um, NWA, 80% uh, of our students, um, we saw the growth with um, in uh, their reading levels to go up from the beginning of the year, so that was pretty awesome to see on that. Some grammar schools we hit, uh, those are just a small portion. I mean, we've gone through all types of sentence structures, and it's, it's pretty much everything that 8th grade, 7th grade, 6th grade classes do. We just kind of do it at a different level, accommodate a little bit. Um, our writing skills hit comprehension questions heavily when we do books as classes. Um, essays we've done, we're doing a practice our persuasive essay as well, uh, but they've done a fictional narrative in that class as well. Uh, whole class novels, I've done in my class, um, Everlost and Outsiders and Sight, which is, um, it was a, a challenge, I think I, I am, it's going well. It's a very high level book, <coughs> eighth graders have very high interest, like they really, it, it's tough because they do have lower reading levels, but they're so invested in the high level thinking. Um, we talk a ton about vocab, so I think them understanding the vocabulary terms, and they are able to converse with me and, and talk with me, so I know they're understanding it. So it's just a lot slower pace, but they understand what's happening is the big thing I'm kind of looking forward to that. And then in sixth grade reading, we are reading right now and Night Divided, um, which is a very good book. It's about um, West and East Berlin, and the family, so part of the family goes to the West to try to find a job and a uh, place to live, and the wall goes up, so the family's divided, and it's just how they get along and communicate. And then we also read, read Restart and Stolen Children. And then we have that uh, Indonesian writing, 75% of our students have written in that area as well. So. Right, these are some of the things that we just wanted to highlight, some of our, um, like awesome moments. Um, so our first one, this is Jaden Ross. She actually won the St. John Community Center Library Spooky Story. And if you ever, they have the audio on their website. I have the story, it's phenomenal. I love her, she, this like boosted her confidence so much and made my heart happy. Um, we have our spelling bee winners, which are um, Kennedy and Olivia kind of went over. And then these are our million word readers, like as of right now. So it's kind of a mix of both seventh and eighth graders. Um, let's see. There's Frankie, okay, so there's Frankie, Hunter, Jacob, Maggie, Heidi, and then, and then this is Kirsten, Clementine, and Jersey, and then literally the day after I took the photo, uh, Grace Bird had reached her one million words as well, so I wanted to make sure. And then um, I think uh, our middle school presenters were telling you earlier what an awesome kid Hunter is. Hunter's the one that's about ready to reach his two million. Probably. He's probably reached it by now. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably way to find it. Okay, real quick on Spelling Bee. Sorry, I probably should have said that, but so the Spelling Bee, we had how many, you know, we all did a Spelling Bee in our own classroom. And so then we probably sent 24 to Dr. Mercer, who got thrown into it because we had so many snow days. So he did a great job with our Spelling Bee this year. Um, and then those four, well, the three and then one alternate, they got to go to North County and compete in the conference Spelling Bee. And Joseph Rutler, made it to the top six after like 18 rounds. Um, and so that's awesome, because we've been had someone go that far in a long time. Joseph was very determined because he's made it in the past years. Reese Wiffmeyer walked into the SGMS spelling bee and was like, I got out on Motley last year, and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> so he's determined as an eighth grader to win next year. Um, 
but they said the top two of the conference this year, they ran out of the packet words, so they literally got out the dictionary and just started randomly picking words. But if you've never been to a conference spelling bee, the words are insane. The kids are awesome they're supposed to do this. I mean, I could do it. I think way too nervous. <laughs> And then these are just pictures, since we're talking about the independent reading, um, we took our kids down to the library after Christmas break in January, and this is like their stack of books that they've read so far. So this is Jacob. <laughs> like, he doesn't even know all the books. That's <laughs> so, so crazy. Um, but it's so exciting for us to see these kids with these books and the accomplishment that they are making. Um, but yeah, so we're pretty proud of them. Yeah. We just wanted you to have a visual of yeah. what their stack of books look like. I'm sure the librarian thought we were crazy. And, and she maybe, probably hated us. <laughs> but uh, she was very accommodating. Was. And um, the kids are so proud standing there by their books. And then I think we had one more yep. slide of pictures with just a few more kids in their stack of books. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Wow. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. a great presentation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Right. Next on the agenda, we have the Prop SG update. And that's going to be Dr. Taylor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, this picture on the screen is a rendering of what uh, Bloomsdale Elementary will look like whenever we're finished. Um, it's been very exciting with the ground breaking out there. And then every time you drive by or stop by, something new is going on. If we could just keep the rain away, something new would be going on much faster. Um, this is, of course, uh, the groundbreaking. And I think Bailey has the video in here of her drone footage. Um, so we had several students out there in hard hats, and I don't think you could find anything cuter than a student with a hard hat and a golden shovel. Uh, we had several visitors. Uh, students, families, faculty and staff, uh, facility committee members, Prop SG campaign committee members, campaign donors, board of education members, community leaders, business owners, elected representatives, Brock Miller Construction and KRJ Architects. Um, the students led us in the Pledge of Allegiance to get us started and then helped the board of education members count down to turn a shovel of dirt. Um, this is a secure main entrance, it will be composed of approximately 1,500 square foot addition um, and allows secure entry and keeps the people in the office safe as well. And Bailey was out there this morning and took some pictures today. So you can see that there's some forms going in for some concrete walls um, and it was, it was very exciting. I know, I think Kelly mentioned earlier that some of the ceiling tiles were coming down and I know what's going in after the ceiling tiles come down so it's very very exciting. Um, the other projects are coming along as well still in, in planning uh, phases. We are meeting Friday uh, to get back together with Brock Miller Construction and KRJ uh, figure out where we are on Bloomsdale and then talk about some um, updates to the other projects as well. Um, one of the Key updates, uh, Mrs. Drury and Bethany Ketting uh, took a trip back to Orchard Farm to talk to Carrie, is that correct, Jamie? Um, who is very knowledgeable and has ran that facility uh, really, really well for a number of years and brought back some really important updates. And then Friday at our River PD event, uh, I sat down with Superintendent at Herculaneum and began talking about our Prop, Prop SG and all the projects, and then they started talking about their early childhood center and um, how it's run, and then some options uh, that they presented that might be options for us as well. So uh, Mrs. Drury and Bethany are gonna get a, on a phone call with them, and hopefully sometime soon we'll visit them and see how they do things there as well. So lots of exciting things going on with Prop SG. Um, at some point, Probably in a couple months, we'll try to bring KRJ and Brock Miller back to give you an update from their perspective and what's going on. But we have run into some snags. There, there always are. Um, I think there's a water line down where the high school gym is supposed to go that we have to figure out whose it is and if a DNR uh, permit needs to be um, gained before we can do anything. And then we have to work with Citizens Electric to move electric. And uh, so there's there's always snags and bumps in the road. Uh, but 
we are working with two quality companies um, that, that have really good communication. Um, and any time they have a question, they call us or we call them. Um, so it's, it's going really, really well so far. I'll entertain any questions if you have any. The next one on the schedule is the St. Genevieve Elementary entrance as well as the middle school elevator. Is that August 23? Um, that, are you talking about finish or start? Start. Start is supposed to be March, April. Oh, March, April. <laughs> <laughs> okay. March, April. Yeah, it sneaks up on you pretty quick. Okay. Do they have to do any relocating like they did at Bloomsdale? Um, KRJ is pretty good about getting with engineering and uh, geotechnical services to determine where all of those things are. I have not heard anything on St. Jen Elementary. Um, I've said this over and over at every update presentation I've given. Parking is going to be hard. It's so going about parking. We're, we're going to continue to work through that. Um, there are no answers that are going to solve the problem. We can make do and make fit until we get through construction and hopefully come up with some final solutions. Um, Parking is going to be hard. We've asked KRJ to get in touch with some people that they've worked with in the past to do a parking study uh, to get some people who are familiar with doing that kind of thing on site to see what we're working with, what's going in, and then adjustments that, that could be made or suggested. Um, I have, we have yet to hear back from them. Hopefully Friday we'll get an update on that. Well, it'll be just elementary or middle school too with that elevator going in there? It's going to be the entire campus because it's a domino effect. As the elementary gets impacted, then it impacts high school in the back, and then it impacts middle. It's, it's going to be quite the challenge. Oh, sorry. I have one more slide. <laughs> and we have an early childhood meeting at the end of February. Um, I don't know, for whatever reason, this, this is really exciting. I, th I think partnering with the community and providing this service to the community has been our goal all along. And it seems like every time we reach a hurdle and we're able to get across it, we're, we're one step closer to that. Um, Geotech has been out to that site and they've done their drilling. Uh, we should talk about uh, the results of that on Friday and, and get started on where the building's going to go. I know we have to work with Citizens Electric to determine where their access road is to that uh, substation back there. Um, and then at some point in the future, hopefully begin talking to all the entities involved of, with perhaps uh, a road extension out to 61. Question about the early childhood. I think I read that the state um, has made some funds available to expand early childhood education, but I believe that it has to be open by December 31 of 24. Um, I don't know if that's realistic or not, or if that's even applicable to us, but have we looked into that? We've looked into that already, and I don't think that we're going to qualify uh, to expand at that point because the facility will most likely not be complete at that mm -hmm. time. Um, I know Bethany Ketting and, and Mrs. Drury have, have also looked at that and to see if we could expand what we're currently doing. Um, we're out of space, which is why we need an early childhood. <laughs> so. And we did, I don't know if you want to mention, we just got that $30,000 grant. Go ahead, Mrs. Uh, Drury. We, however, I know it's been talked about to bring the name, but Bethany Ketting and I wrote a grant for a $30,000 grant for a school for the first year, it's already been awarded. We're actually going to do the budget entry here this week. And then it's for the playground type of thing. <clears throat> Hopefully that we can take with us to the new building. Yeah. And then it is you can try to you can apply to review it for two consecutive years yet. So hopefully that area will be thirty thousand dollars times two to apply for the new building. So we're actively looking for grants and money every okay. time that we can. <laughs> yeah. I seen it, I thought it's it's a tight timeline and mm -hmm. there were some stipulations around it and you know, low income and which may qualify for, but there's a lot of things. Yeah, I don't want to say red tape, but red tape around the end of qualify for. Well, and the superintendents groups are pushing for early childhood education, preschool, to be part of our ADA, our average daily attendance, and the 
we get funding from those kids like we do our kindergarten through 12. So we're really pushing because people are paying attention to early childhood education. You know, if we're going to educate them, then all of a sudden you have time. Do we know if that's been presented to the legislature at all? Um, I don't know. We had the discussion to get today again with the intro. I'll be happy to send Mrs. Gannon and Mr. Francis an email. That would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have the 2023-2024 school calendar. <coughs> Do adjust the Zoom. So last month uh, you were presented with an initial draft calendar for consideration. Um, just to review our process, we take the current calendar year's calendar and roll that over uh, into the next calendar year uh, and, and make it fit, if you will. Um, whether it fits nicely or it, it doesn't fit so nicely, uh, we just put those dates into the corresponding dates in the upcoming calendar year, and that's a starting point. Um, there's a couple things to keep in mind um, when creating a calendar. Our calendar committee does a very good job of getting input. Um, from our faculty and staff, we send out a survey to them to uh, gather comments um, as they look at that draft calendar and make suggestions. It's important that we maintain the uh, educational integrity of our calendar and not just create a calendar of convenience. Um, so our, our calendar committee uh, is really conscientious about and maintaining that educational integrity. Um, the calendar committee met initially on December 20th to discuss the rollover calendar and develop a plan for the survey. Uh, during this meeting, the calendar committee also discussed several ideas regarding adjustments to the new calendar that may need, that may need to be considered. The committee met again on January 31st. After the survey was complete, the survey was open for a week. Um, and then when it was complete, we reviewed the comments that were submitted and finalized a draft calendar for your consideration. Uh, the comments were provided to you in your packet. Uh, we received a total of 137 comments. Um, 64 of those said, it looks great. So that was overwhelming. <laughs> there, there were several uh, adjustments that you could just look at the rollover calendar and, and in your mind you start moving dates around to see what will fit. Um, so I am going to go over um, some adjustments that we have. The calendar presented to you this evening has some significant differences to the calendar presented to you last month, month which I will highlight. Uh, the dead period, which was approved by the board on August 30th, 2022, will be from July 29th to August 6th. <laughs> Julia, that's a little too big. <laughs> You're not even touching the keyboard. Hit, uh, hit control plus and minus on your... Uh, the new teacher PD days will be <laughs> August 7th through the 9th. Uh, we moved those from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to provide the new teachers with a little more time to get in their classrooms before uh, we come back for all school PD. Um, we then have orientations, additional PD days, open houses, all leading up to the first day of school, which is scheduled to be on Monday, August 21st. That's a little too small. <laughs> Monday, August 21st is the first day that we can have school. Um, there were a couple of comments uh, for, on the survey saying let's move it two days before and we would love to, but state statute says we can't. Um, so that's our first day of school. Um, the PD day, traditionally held on the Friday prior to Labor Day, has now found a new home and it is Monday, October 2nd. Uh, there were several comments that there was a big uh, span of time between the beginning of September and then parent-teacher conference. Um, so the calendar committee thought it was a good idea to move that PD day to Monday, October 2nd. Uh, parent-teacher conference that will then be held after 1 p.m. Um, after a 1 p.m. dismissal on Thursday, October 26th. There's a bud stuck somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> We will have no school on Veterans Day, Friday, November 10th. We will have half a day on Wednesday, November 22nd, and that begins our Thanksgiving break. We then go to Friday, December 22nd at one, 
at 1 p.m. Uh, we will have an early out day and then we are scheduled to return on January 8th to begin the second semester. So you will notice last year that was on that half day was on a Wednesday and then we came back on a Thursday, I believe. Um, moving this half day to Friday gives us a full two weeks for Christmas, which is what we try to traditionally do, but it also um, sandwiches those in between two, two weekends on the end and a weekend in the middle, which uh, everybody was excited about. Uh, President's Day is on February 19th, which will be sandwiched by our River PD event. Uh, on Friday, February 16th, St. Genevieve is hosting. That's going to be really interesting with construction and parking. <laughs> so Dr. McClard is going to have quite the task. And we hear that Windsor wants to get back in to the River PD event. They, they dropped out this year, so it was just three schools uh, traveling to Herculaneum. Uh, Windsor wants, we've heard through the grapevine, that they, they're interested in coming back in. So that would bring three schools to our campus. I did not. Well. <laughs> we will then have a traditional PD day on Tuesday, February 20th. Um, a lot of times when you go to PD events, outside of the district or even to the River PD event on Friday that we uh, travel to. Um, you, you get some good tips and some good ideas to bring back with you, but then you don't get to debrief. Um, thinking about that idea, going to that River PD event on Friday and then being able to debrief at that PD day uh, following President's Day was really important. Friday, March 29th, we'll begin our first ever spring break, which will continue through Friday, April 5th. I will talk a little more about how that was possible in just a moment. Um, we were set to return to school on April 8th, but another significant eclipse will occur on April 8th, which pushes our return from spring break to Tuesday, April 9th. Yeah. Um, our last scheduled day of school is Tuesday, May 21st, 2024, with our last PD day scheduled for Wednesday, May 22nd. Um, another significant change to this calendar was to adjust how our inclement weather days and AMI days are distributed. We had 15 comments uh, suggesting that we move AMI days before snow days. Um, so, and that makes sense if you, if you think about being a teacher and you could use your AMI days up front and not have any additional days tacked onto the calendar. Um, traditionally, we have our five snow days and then we start our AMI days. So, the calendar committee put our heads together and, and came up with uh, something in the middle. Have two snow days, two traditional snow days first, then get your five AMI days in, and then if you have additional inclement weather days, you tack those three snow days onto the end. Um, last possible makeup day for students is Wednesday, May 29th. Uh, the semester's balanced pretty well using this. Uh, calendar scheme. First semester is 84 days. Second semester is 86 <coughs> days. Uh, that was 82 and 89 last year, I believe. Um, <coughs> we now have a total of 1,097 total student hours of attendance. Last year we had 1101.5 hours of attendance. Uh, state requirement is 1044. So, um, a couple years ago, I came across some information from the MAAA schools that indicated we go a significant amount of time over the other schools in our conference. Um, we have 190 contracted days. The next highest school in our conference is 185. The lowest is 179. So some schools are going 179 and we're going 190. Given everything that we've heard on surveys, everything that we've heard talking to teachers, um, go, coming out of the pandemic and, and trying to get back to some kind of normal school, uh, they're mentally and physically exhausted. So coming out of the pandemic, I had this bright idea to put an Excel sheet together and just kind of figure out what taking a day away from their contract would cost. And it turned out in this calendar we needed two days. Uh, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 to 600 plus dollars, depending on where someone falls on the salary schedule. So by approving this calendar tonight, the board would be approving 
reducing the number of contracted days from 190 to 188. Um, that still leaves us three days over the next highest uh, school in our conference and still well over the state requirement of 1,044 hours. We are at 1,097. Um, I think this, this does several things. Um, it, it shows our people we care about them. Um, we do care about their mental health and their physical well-being and um, this gives back to them and, and allows them to spend some more time with their family. A um, couple other things. This will not reduce our current base salary or reduce the salary of any certified staff member. Um, Dr. Fleeg is going to be talking about budget in a minute, uh, the February budget amendment. And then as we get closer to the end of the school year, we'll have more budget numbers and have more solid uh, foundation on, on making budget decisions. I know it's always in the board's mind to, to give a raise to the base if we can, um, increase hourly wages if we can. Um, this allows the board to, in essence, give a raise without adding money to the base. We're, we're taking those contracted days away, which is money that is in the pocket of our uh, employees. So as more details emerge regarding budget, um, Dr. Fleeg and I are going to share information on, on what's possible for the upcoming school year. Um, I did uh, have a talk with Stephanie, uh, called her and, and kind of brought her in the loop and tried to, to, to gauge where, where they might be and, and I think they seem to be on board. Um, the, the more you think about it and the more you put it into the calendar and we're able to visualize it, the more it just kind of made sense. I've been hearing since I was a teacher, why don't we have a spring break and all the other conferences in our... Some, some schools in our conference have a fall and a spring break. Um, there are a couple of variables that go into play there. Uh, they, a lot of those schools go more than six and a half hours a day. And when you, when you go 6.75 hours a day, that 0.25 builds up over the course of a year and you're able to use that. Uh, giving our size, given our size of our county, we're not able to do that. Um, you just can't have kids on buses that long. So, um, just wanted to be clear. Nobody's uh, trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. This, by approving this calendar, you would be reducing the contracted time of our certified employees by two days, from 190 to 188. So, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Only question really is, um, I know it's four and a half hours, so I'd say it's not substantial, but it is to our educators, and I think that's important. But um, is our curriculum set up to be able to reduce that number of days? Are we going to be okay there? Or is uh, that going to mean an adjustment to our curriculum as well? Well, our curriculum comes from the state, and that's not going to be changed. So our teachers, if you think about the number of days that a school in our conference, 179, are attempting to get the curriculum in, and I know our educators, our educators could do it in 179 days. We've always traditionally gone more than the other schools in our conference because we value education. Not that they don't, but we've always expressed that in the number of hours that we go. Um, I'm, I'm fully confident our educators can do that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I have no qualms about that. I think that we have high quality educators who can do that. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm always in favor, and I know they're going to like to hear this, of taking something off their plate. And so we're always looking for things that we can reduce the workload and reduce the stress on them. Um, and I, I don't want taking these two days away to add to the stress, um, and I, I, I don't think yeah. they're going to look at it. Okay. So two less contracted days, no reduction in salary or pay. Correct. I, I can feel Bailey looking at me, so I'm just going to say this. <laughs> Hourly folks. Hourly folks, yeah. Um, as, as budget numbers bec become more solidified, we're hopeful that we're able to address those two days that our hourly folks would lose um, in, in some type of, of pay raise. And Dr. Fleeg's goal has been to get that to $15 an hour for the last three years, I know. Um, and and that's, that's still the goal. I know my goal would be to, I know we're talking about this and this is wonderful and I've seen the surveys asking for more time off. You know, 
we can incorporate a salary increase, that would be wonderful. And you know, set that goal at 16 instead of 15. Mm -hmm. But we have to be fiscally responsible also. But I appreciate it. And I do want to commend the, the calendar committee. They have every time I meet with them, they have great suggestions, and they're really conscientious about trying to put something together that makes sense for for our kids and for our employees. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we'll make a motion to approve the 2023 24 calendar as presented. Okay. Second. Eric. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Welcome to spring break. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, we move on to new business on the agenda, and the first item is the amended budget. So I'm going to talk about some of those. So this is our best guess right now with that approach. Um, my hope is that this balance that we're going to grow, as a reminder, is for the legal fees to battle the wholesome lawsuits. Um, hopefully, I'm hoping that it is higher and closer to the actual amount we're bringing in for ESSER 3 Does that make sense? OK. So first, we're going to look at the revenues. And so we start on page 14. Um, with our local taxes, we have reduced the collection rate from 64% to 63%. Local taxes are not coming in quite as high as we thought they would. So that's a reduction in what we think we're going to get at the local level of $283,000. Um, delinquent taxes are really coming in at a lower rate than in previous years. So we did reduce our delinquent taxes by $20,000. Um, there's no change in the, the Prop S, Prop C money. We left that amount the same. Um, there's a significant change in the financial institution tax. Um, that definition is taxes levied on the intangible assets of financial institutions such as banks or savings and loan associations. Um, when Dr. Lindsay was here, we would get somewhere between $120,000 and $150,000 in this financial institution tax. There were some changes to the tax laws for banks and loan, um, savings and loans. Um, so what I've done in the past is use the previous year's actual amount. So last year in this revenue account, we received about $25,000. So that was the amount I budgeted for this year. Uh, we've actually received $365, and that is probably all we're going to receive. So we reduced this uh, revenue account significantly. M&M um, surtax, replacement tax on commercial real estate to replace revenue lost with the elimination of merchants and manufacturing businesses inventory tax. This M&M surtax is coming in lower than projected, so that's a reduction of about $22,000. Uh, we did see an increase uh, our earnings on temporary investments. Um, that we did reduce the premium on bonds. 
uh, we had we did have seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars in there, but that was for the full ten million dollars for Prop SG. Since the timelines have been adjusted and we're we're moving a little bit slower than anticipated, we're not going to actually collect all of that ten million dollars or pull that in and expend it out of this budget. So we reduced um, those earnings and we reduced the uh, the bond amount, which you'll see in a little bit. Uh, state assessed railroad and utility, a positive here. We increased that by $95,000. No changes in state money. Uh, state transportation, which is 5312. If you're trying to keep up with me. <clears throat> we had 750,000 in the original September amendment, trying to be conservative. Um, we're still a little leery of going the full amount that the state says we're going to get. So we did increase the revenue on state transportation to 950,000. Um, the legislature legislation session is still going on. If there's a withhold in any of our funding, it will come out of transportation. Um, so we set it at 950,000. We may actually get $1.1 million if they continue to, to fund transportation as they say they're going to. But we tried to be a little bit more conservative just in case. Um, no change in classroom trust fund. The 5332, the vocational enhancement grant, we reduced that based on the actual amount we sent, we spent in the CTE programs at the high school. Career and technical education is um, agriculture, business, family and consumer sciences, and automotive. So we apply for this enhancement grant every year for items to enhance the education of th those students. So we reduced it based on what we're actually spending. We did see a small increase in the high need fund for special education. So we increased it $11,000. And our other federal revenue, which is $54.97. And other federal revenue it, are amounts received from federal sources not listed in the Missouri Financial Accounting Manual. For us, that includes community service grants and U.S. Treasury interest subsidies. So we did reduce it $83,000 based on the data that we, we have collected and the money we have received. Um, and the significant change comes in 5611, the sale of bonds. We decreased uh, from 10 million to 5 million. So that's where the big 5 million number comes from. We don't expect to bring in the full 10 million. Again, because the, the projects have started a little bit slower. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to jump to expenses, and there's a lot of accounts in the expenses. Before you get too far, but the sure. transportation, that's yes. one one we're expecting, is that what we'll be paying straight to Ballard? Yes, sir? That is what the state pays us. So they're saying they're totally funding it. They fund it at 75%. Okay. That's fully funding it. Okay. We actually spend more than that with Ballard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. One point. That's what I thought. 1.4, almost 1.5, yes. <clears throat> so the overall different changes in expenses are reduced by 5 million also. Um, but we are reducing ex uh, revenues more than we're reducing expenses. So we're spending a little bit more out of expenses. Um, so what we're seeing in expenses at the elementary level, there's an increase of about $47,000 um, just based on additional funds needed for supplies and increases in salaries. Um, high school, an increase of about $20,000. This is, again, for salaries. Um, we're seeing an increase in early childhood spe special education because we opened that third classroom. We had to get furniture and materials in th that classroom. Uh, like I said earlier, we de decrease the expenses uh, for our CTE enhancement grant. So again, that's BOAG, business, um, facts, and automotive. Um, we reduced the contracted amount we're paying to Bar Perryville Area Career and Technical Center. Um, by about $15,000, so we have less students attending than we anticipated. 
Um, we have an increase in speech language pathologist needs. So that would be 2152. And that increases about 15,000. Um, and it's based on pupil services. Pupil services are can be contracted um, agencies or, or people to come in and work with students to address needs. Um, we see an increase in our behavioral intervention services of about $71,000. And again, that's we added, we filled an aid position that's been open, but again, it's contracted. Um, we have some students with some high needs and we're bringing in some behavior specialists to work with them. Um, staff training, we saw a slight decrease of about $16,000, uh, just less needs in travel and conference fees right now at this time of the year. Um, instruction related technology and admin technology services, that is for our tech department. Basically, she moved money out of one account to the other. Um, we got a grant to cover uh, the cost of Chromebooks. Um, I don't remember how many she said. 200? No. 200? Anyway, the grant covers the biggest portion. The district will cover the other portion. So um, we had to put the expenses in one account and move it out of the other. Um, the Board of Education, uh, we left $450,000 in the legal fees. Uh, we spent about $101,000 um, based on the wholesome lawsuit, the majority of that. We went ahead and left the four hundred fifty dollars because we know there's a lot going on, uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of information exchange. So we're just not sure how much that's going to be, so we left it high. In the board account, we did decrease the um, election account because we don't have to hold an election. Last year, we spent about $18,000 with the board election and the Prop SG. Typically, if you're not running a bond issue, it's somewhere in between 12 and 14. So I did, we decreased it about $16,000. So that's a nice savings. Um, payroll services is an increase of $86,000, and that's judgments against the district. So in March of 20, the IRS put out the COVID-19 employer, employer credits. So we applied for the credits and moved forward with not paying those tax payments like was allowed. But the documentation was not clear that the tax credits were not applicable in school districts, public school districts could not apply for them. So we have the documentation. We sent in appeal after appeal after appeal, and they were all denied. So we had to pay that tax bill, and it was about $88,000. So we paid that tax bill this year. Uh, maintenance and custodial, um, we, I did, we were able to decrease it about 100000 based on what they've currently spent. But then Davey just came to us, and they need a... Something for one of the freezers, maybe a compressor. I don't know. So we don't think we'll think there's still quite a bit of money in there. So we should be okay. Uh, disabled transportation increased about sixty-eight thousand dollars. We're running two buses this year instead of one. Um, in non-allowable transportation, twenty-five fifty-eight. There we did increase it twenty-five thousand dollars to purchase a van for the school district. Um, this purchase was necessary because we contract with Enterprise, and Enterprise raised their van rate from $75.99 per day to $135.99, which is a 78.96% increase. To rent a car went from $39.99 a day to $96.06, which is a 140% increase. So looking at our historical data, what we spent last year with Enterprise was about 10500 So we applied the increase, and that would increase our cost. Just looking at last year's data, it would go from ten five to $22,000. So we felt it was time to look at purchasing a district van. So we have a maroon van, <laughs> maroon. and we have the white special ed van. Um, and we're going to take a hard look in June, and if the funds are there, we'll probably buy a third one just to give our people options. And it should also uh, save the district money on mileage reimbursements. So Chrissy Gettinger is going to manage the check the van checkouts. So we're working on all of that. Um, there is a significant increase in food prep. 
uh, of $91,000. This is due to the inflation and the difficulty in obtaining food items. Uh, we, we're still struggling with that. Jordan's doing a fantastic job, but it is costing us a significant amount of money to keep up. Um, there is an increase in the architectural fees because of Prop SG. We increased it $150,000. And then uh, the big decrease is in facility acquisitions. Uh, we decreased that 5.4 million. And again, that's because we think we're only gonna spend about 5 million of the current 10 million in the Prop SG account. And that's a lot. Yeah. So that's the big picture. Um, if you go to page 96, That's looking at our balances. Um, it's got the tax rate, the collection rate, um, how much is paid to the assessor for the, the taxes, um, how much taxes we think we're going to collect, and then at the very bottom it looks at balances as of June 30, 2022, and what we're projecting as of June 30, 2023. So a little bit of growth there. As I said, that's with the ESSER 3 money. Um, page 97 is the historical data on our debt service tax rate, and it shows how much we've rolled back for many years. Page 98 is our tax rate history, just so you can see the uh, property assessments and then um, how much we're putting in operating well, fund one, fund two, fund three, and fund four. And then the very last page um, is the 2022-23 tax rate comparison for surrounding school districts. Um, so we are still fourth from the bottom with Perryville, Arcadia Valley, and Potosi having lower tax rates than we do. Everyone else has a much higher tax rate. And so Dr. Taylor will need this slide in August when he presents the tax rate information. <laughs> so that's a lot of information. Uh, I tried to keep it high level, but with the big difference in the revenue expenses, I wanted to dig in a little bit more this time. Can we do it? Are we still on track for the um, tax commission hearing in May? Um, last I heard that they were going to ask for an extension. It's probably going to have to be pushed back because the, what's it called? The data exchange, discovery. the discovery is taking so long. Last I heard was January. Yeah. You heard January? Okay. 24 now? Yeah. Yes. You know, after the next tax. This budget, even though I mean we're over that, thank you for going over those differences. Still leaves us six hundred fifty-eight thousand in the black mm -hmm. for all any debt reserves. So. Right. Yes. And I know you mentioned that was Esther. Um, yes. Three mostly. Yes. But and there is, in addition to that six hundred fifty-eight, there's always two hundred twenty thousand in contingency. So if you add that to it, it's more. But we put that contingency money in there, just in case. I certainly hope there won't be any withholdings considering yeah. there's a surplus in the state budget right now. Right. We're not hearing anything that there will be, but we always like to plan as if they were, so. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the February amended budget for the 2022-2023 school year as presented. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next we have the CSIP Comprehensive School Improvement Plan. So this is normally the time of the year where we sit down and make adjustments and um, get it approved. We're doing it a little bit different this year. We're looking at it as a whole. So for the comprehensive school improvement plan, excuse me, 
our goal is to have a document that will guide us through the next five years. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to look at some of the CSIFs of surrounding schools and grading them for Cal State for Innocent Six, and I've seen a, a wide variety of some that were developed with consultants, some that were kind of a rehash of what they've done before, and others where they moved up to the wording in so six. And um, plenty of the ones that we've seen that are very comprehensive are also simplistic in a way where they have pillars that guide them, and then they have objectives that fall under them that are still big rocks. And then they start to list some of the strategies that are applicable to either the building level or even the district level. So our goal now, our goal now is to um, define those pillars and look at those. Um, I originally took our CSIP and put them under our pillars. We looked at those, started looking at some themes, um, named those themes. And then the next step was to go to our faculty and ask, what do you think our big rocks are? If we want to graduate students that are college, career, and life ready and have the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be successful in whatever they choose, even if they don't know what they want to choose yet, um, what do we need to do in the next five years? And so we've gotten a lot of good input. And so I've taken those and compared them over the weekend to what we already had as themes. And they align pretty closely. But the next step is to either get their input through a survey or get input by pulling a committee and redefining maybe some of those themes as objectives and saying these are our big rocks. For instance, um, literacy, um, behavior, SEL, mental health are kind of lumped into one. Long range facilities planning is still a piece of it as well. And so to take those and kind of redefine those objectives. And then I think our goal after that will be to develop a committee of some sort so we can get parental and community input and then um, ask that committee, are we missing something? Do we need to reword something? After we get that input, then the next step is to actually look at what strategies do we need? And that's where we get kind of into the planning of, well, what do we need to do to increase literacy? Like what steps are we taking? Some of those we are already currently taking and we're on track for, but it's a, it's a good way for us to say, these are our priorities and when other items are pulling for our attention to come back to that CSIP that was created by everybody and say, well, this is what we originally agreed we wanted for the next five years. So if it doesn't fit within this plan, we're not going to use it unless if it's an emergency or something that we're forced to have to look at through legislation or something like that. Um, so that's, that's the goal, the timeline. We're trying to speed up the timeline. Um, I would like to have it finish by the end of the school year, I think is, is the goal. So I think the next step is to either, like I said, do the survey with teachers or pull a group together and say, okay, what are our actual big objectives? Do you have any questions over it? Not yet. Okay, <laughs> all right. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a board resolution to oppose open enrollment in Missouri. Yes, um, I believe, well, I know there is an open enrollment bill in the Senate and there is one in the House. Um, from what I heard today on a legislation update from the uh, Missouri Association of School Administrators, they're not sure the Senate version is going to make it out. It doesn't have the votes to currently go through. Um, the House Bill 253, they think, has a better chance, but right now it doesn't have the votes either. Um, but that could change in any, any minute. Um, so Mayor had put out, um, Mayor is the Missouri Association of Rural, is it educators? Like, education something like that it's another like msba and mayor are the two organizations for school boards um st jen is a member of both 
mayor put out this resolution uh, to oppose open enrollment and shared it with all of these superintendents across the state and asked them to present it to their boards for consideration. Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. We are presenting this open enrollment bill to you for consideration. Um, we have concerns with the House bill's version. The Senate, yes, definitely, but you know, we're gonna focus on the House, the information that I have here because it has, I think, a better chance of making it out. Um, for the first few years, there's caps. And, you know, guys, feel free to jump in. Um, there's caps on the number of students you can accept. Um, but over time, those caps go away. Um, you can choose to accept students through open enrollment, a district can, uh, but you can't prevent your students from leaving. Um, and I think the thing that probably has us most concerned is you don't have to accept students with special needs. Um, that is just not right. Um, and it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Um, yeah, there are, there are a couple items that are very concerning. Um, equity, which Dr. Fleet just talked about, and not only for students um, with special needs or special circumstances, but also socioeconomic um, equity as well. Um, you have to think about the students that are going to be traveling to other school districts, um, and just their access alone is something that lower socioeconomic uh, families may not have. Um, Something that came to my mind as I was reading through this bill was, you know, our community has a history of supporting our school district. And our school district has a history of being fiscally responsible and being honest and open with our community. So now, if, should this bill pass, um, we are going to be going to our community to ask for a no tax increase bond issue or to ask for a tax increase bond issue at some point in time. And now, members of our community will be voting on that, and their children will be going to another school district. A possibility. But you have to think about that level of community and that level of trust that you have. Now, we're going to have, school districts are going to have members of their community that send their kids elsewhere and are going to be asked to vote on a tax increase or to continue uh, a bond. Um, that, to me, does not breed camaraderie and community and um, you know in my hometown the, the school district was where it was at that that's what brought community to it I, I feel like that's what we do here in St. Jen as well um, that's very very concerning to me um, and that's just two that I'm going to speak about <laughs> See me. Do you like that? I think another point brought up by organizations is that it's going to take away we just got done with River Summit and working with surrounding schools and working as a collaborative group, it's gonna take away from that. It's gonna create more competition. Right now it's a competitive, we see you on the field, we're gonna beat you, but now it's gonna be, we're gonna hide how we're doing things that benefit our students. Um, I'm not saying we will do that, but that's gonna create a culture of that. Um, I think school districts are gonna to have to end up paying for some of the flashier things, maybe more than marketing like colleges would. And some of that money that would normally be spent for students is now being spent to attract people. Um, and then I think, I don't think this will affect us, but surrounding areas, it's, schools are the center of their community. And it's going to affect some of those schools when they don't have enough students to stay open. And then it's going to affect that community as well. I have a statement that I prepared for, that I'll be sending to Senator Ian, Representative um, Francis, so I'm going to read that, so uh, I can tell him I have a kid for <laughs> email my legislators, I'm not afraid to. So open enrollment refers to the policy of allowing students to attend any public school of their choice, regardless of their place of residence or the school's geographic boundaries. While this may seem like an excellent idea, there are several reasons why I, along with many others, oppose it. Open enrollment creates the potential for overcrowding. If a popular school receives too many transfer requests, it may become overcrowded, leading to a decrease in the quality of education. This can lead to larger class sizes, reduced attention from teachers, and less access to resources, including extracurricular activities. Overcrowding may also result in the school district needing to spend additional funds to build new facilities or expand existing ones. One of the biggest financial questions left in the current proposed legislation is how the funding will flow. 
No, another argument against open enrollment is that it can reduce the quality of education across the board. When students are allowed to attend any school they want, there may, may be less incentive for schools to compete and improve their programs. If schools know that they will receive students regardless of their quality of education, they may not feel the need to invest in new programs, technology, or other resources. This can result in a stagnation of educational innovation and a decline in the quality of education overall. I relate to that as all the kids want to go play football at Alabama, right? Because Alabama has the football team. Finally, open enrollment may have unintended, unintended consequences for the allocation of resources. If students are free to attend any school, it may be difficult to predict how many students will attend each school, making it challenging for school districts to plan for resource allocation. This can lead to inefficiencies, with some schools receiving more resources than they need, while others left struggling. In conclusion, while the concept of open enrollment may seem like an excellent idea, it is essential to consider the potential unintended consequences. Open enrollment can lead to increased segregation, overcrowding, and reduced quality of education. It may also have unintended consequences for the allocation of resources. Therefore, it is important for policymakers to consider these factors when considering open enrollment policies. Thank you. I want to share a few other things. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'll be reaching out to our legislators too. The idea here is choice, but I mean, between charters, privates, public schools, homeschooling, and if you remember, over the past five years, we've added virtual schooling. You have all these choices already. So if you live in, I don't want to pick on a small school district, but a very small school district where you can't take calculus or physics or French, you can take those things virtually. Now that's not the optimum answer, but it is an answer. And that was sold to us as solving that problem. And now we want to expand that solution. Um, Dr. Fleeg just went over all the amendments we had to make to the budget because the budget is a guessing game. This will only add to the guessing. Whether we're going to lose students, gain students, I mean, of course, I'm prideful, so of course we're going to gain thousands of students, but either way, it's a budgeting nightmare. Um, and I will tell you my personal opinion is this is a, a piece of legislation that is built to eliminate small school districts. You know, the, the, you can think of them. They're out there within 50 miles of us. Those school districts that have 100, 150 kids that can't offer the classes that we offer, that can't offer the sports that we offer, they will go away slowly. And those communities will die. That's just my opinion. Um, and while we'd love those 1,000 extra kids, where's the funding coming from? Because is it staying with the local school or is it staying following and that's the that's my last point. This will make poor, and I don't mean poor, I mean, you know, they don't have the industrial base that we have here. This will make poor districts poorer. Um, the, the bill that Dr. Flea referred to, the state, the state funds would follow the student. So the state adequacy target is $6,375. I pulled up Desi's website, and this of course varies by pupil, but St. Genevieve spends, according to Desi, $14,336 per student. So for the students that transfer in, we'll get less than half that. And we'll have to come up with that because we're not going to treat them differently. So that means there'll be less spent for the kids who are here. And Mr. McDaniel made a good point. He always does. Um, <laughs> you know, Kids and parents will transfer. I'll even read you a quote for sports. This is a uh, superintendent out of St. Clair School District. He says, if this bill goes through, I expect we'll lose at least 100 or more students. Some will go to Sullivan because they have a state softball team. Some will go to Union because they have a brand new beautiful gymnasium. And some will go to Pacific because they have brand new weight room facilities, all sports related. And again, while I'm prideful and I think people will come here for our academics, our sports, everything, that will mean somebody's kid doesn't get to play that sport. So I am completely and utterly opposed to this. So this is why on March 20th, we're all are we're going to leave Death City to talk to people. I think, I think that's a point to be raised, too. We were told by our legislators during a superintendent's meeting, well, we don't see you guys up here. We see the other side every day. And so it, they're telling us the only way that we have a voice or that they're able to listen to us is if we're up there every day. So we need 
we need everybody that is concerned to be able to actually email their yes. their legislators and let them know. Be parents and Please Absolutely. email Rick Francis, Elaine Gannon, uh, in the northern part of the county to Courtney. Buckeye, okay, Cindy Buckeye Courtway. Cindy Buckeye Courtway. Yeah. Um, the legislators have hard jobs, there's no doubt. I think someone said, I don't know if it was here tonight, they need to be a, a foot deep and a thousand feet long, you know, topic wise. It was in the MSBA video. Um, so there's a lot they're looking at. I asked, I asked our legislators for um, research. I said, send me research that proves that this fixes problems. I don't have an email. Well, on the, I'll be quiet now. On the funding, I, I'll, I'll, I'll point out, 75 to 77 percent of our funding here at St. Jen is local. Um, so for us, the state money following the student isn't as big of a deal. It's a big deal, but not as a big deal as a school district that is formula reliant. You start pulling those kids out, they don't have the local taxes and to take over and and sustain that school. I lied, I'm not gonna shut up. Um, <laughs> you know, we have folks who move here, which is how it works, to, to get their kids into our SPED program and our other programs. And if you can just send your kid here, and you know, I would love to take them all. But that's an even a more higher dollar amount. You know, that 14000 doesn't cover some of those kids. They need higher dollar services. Anyway, <coughs> I'm done. I certainly can. So this states, whereas the Board of Education has resolved to focus resident taxpayer resources upon the education of students who reside in the district, and whereas no credible research shows that open enrollment improves student achievement, and whereas open enrollment will result in a significant adverse financial impact on public schools, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of the St. Denis County R2 School District hereby resolves to oppose any legislation providing for open enrollment in Missouri public schools of non-resident students. Any more comments? All right, I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution for the Board of Education of the St. Denis County R2 School District to oppose any legislation providing for open enrollment Missouri Public Schools for of non-resident students. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. So that will then be forwarded to our legislators. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I'll also put on your radar, if you haven't read Senate Bill 4, the Parents' Bill of Rights, um, please do so. That adds a lot, a lot on school districts. Um, some of it we're doing, but the the amount of information in the short period of time that we're going to have to do to, to get that information out, I don't know how we do it with our current personnel. So if you haven't looked at that one, please take a look at that. Yeah, if you want to see my email, I sent Senator Gannon, let me know. <laughs> you want to read Senate Bill 4, here it is. For those teachers who are sitting in the audience, it adds more for you to do. And how much funding comes with it? Oh. You're right. Zero. Okay, we're really on our soapbox now. <laughs> um, but it's very important. Um, that is all the new business. Next, we have adjourned to executive closed session. Okay, hang on. I'm still getting I'm gonna keep talking. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> I know. Okay. All right, we have that state. All right. I make a motion and to revise Missouri Statute 610.021. I motion that the Board of Education adjourn to a closed meeting with a closed record and a closed vote after a short break for the purpose of discussing and voting upon the following items of business. Hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting of particular employees, scholastic probation, expulsion, or graduation of identifiable individuals. So we will have a roll call vote. Um, yes, sorry, of course I second it. 
Then I'm gonna roll call vote. <laughs> Sorry, gang. <laughs> okay. Okay. Roll call vote. Jamie Blue. Yes. Eric Bosler. Yes. David Boba. Yes. Geraldine Diesel. Yes. Josh Gettinger. Yes. James Kirshner. Yes. Martha Reeson. Yes. All right. Seven zero. It was a long one. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming.